I would like to welcome you all to day two of New York City Jewelry Week. We have 90 events happening throughout the city, and I hope that you will join us and visit www.nycjewelryweek.com to check out all of the other programming that is happening throughout. I am deeply grateful to Commissioner Julie Menon and Amanda Nguyen and the entire team at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and at FIT for making this event possible. Um, as a young woman growing up in New York City, I have attended numerous discussions and events in this very auditorium and have followed and attended uh, Fern Malice's legendary conversations, some here. Um, and so to be able to introduce Fern is an honor and a dream come true. In fact, this entire week um, is really incredible and I'm sure that the panelists will agree that when you love what you do, anything is possible. So without further ado, I would like to, to introduce Fern Malice, the award-winning creator and organizer of Fashion Week in New York. Fern has been an industry game changer for more than 35 years. A former senior vice president of IMG Fashion and executive director of the CFDA, she's the author of Fashion Lives, Fashion Icons with Fern Malice, published by Rizzoli. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome this powerhouse of a woman and this entire powerhouse of a women panel. Thank you. Everybody, and thank you for being here on this kind of grim, cold, rainy, somewhat strange day um, where we're all getting ready for holidays and all sorts of good things, but we're also in the beginning of New York's first Jewelry Fashion Week, which is very, very exciting. And I am really delighted to be here today with this extremely talented panel, which I will introduce them each from, from our seats. And I do congratulate Bella and her associate and partner, J.B. Jones, for getting this week off the ground. I do know what it's like to organize a fashion week and to uh, ask a lot of people to check egos at the door and do something that's good for the entire industry that everybody will benefit from if everybody participates and gives their best. And uh, the programming that they've organized for this first year is, is really staggering. I mean, there's so many things all over the city uh, in every borough almost, and from morning, noon till night. So if you can, make sure you check out the website and go to as many things as you can. Um, I'd also like to thank the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment for organizing this Made in New York talk behind the iconic jewelry on stage and screen. Um, we all love jewelry and accessories, and focusing on that this week just does show how important this is to the fashion world, to retail, to theater, to TV. Jewelry is the oldest art form and predates cave paintings by tens of thousands of years. I've also never been seen without multiple necklaces or bracelets or rings on my body, and my apartment sometimes looks like a uh, boutique. So uh, one of these days I'm going to open it up and start charging people to take things out of there for me. Um, so let's uh, hear what these illustrious ladies have done in their careers and how jewelry uh, and ex uh, especially impacts the costuming and work they do. So I'm going to jump around on my intros because they're not in order of the ladies and the way they're sitting, so bear with me. Of course, the page is going to stick together. So, first we have Catherine Zuber on the end. Yes. Catherine is a graduate of the Yale School of Drama. She has approximately, this was, was in the notes that were given to me, approximately nine Tony Awards. How do you have approximately? No, I have seven. Seven. So that's not approximately nine. <laughs> I was I meant to call somebody on that note. And seven additional Tony nominations and six Drama Desk Awards. 
She is a 2016 Theatre Hall of Fame inductee and winner of the American Theatre Wing's Henry Hughes Award for Outstanding Costume Design in 2003. <clears throat> Her most recent costume design work on Broadway includes My Fair Lady, currently running as a revival, which won her a 2018 Tony Award and a 2018 Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Costume Design for a Musical. Additional plays Catherine has designed costumes for and won awards for include War Paint, which I think we'll talk about today because that's very appropriate, which garnered a nomination for a 2017 Tony Award and a 2017 Drama Desk Award. For The King and I, which won a Tony Award for Best Costume Design of a Musical, she created 250 pieces for the 50-plus strong cast. I could go on and on with more awards and nominations, and a long list of her Broadway and off-Broadway credits, is read, as well as regional theater and opera and dance companies. But we're going to go on to the next. <laughs> so that's Catherine next. Sitting next to Catherine. You know, I'm usually so organized, this is making me crazy that this isn't in order. Jacqueline. Jacqueline Demetrio, Demetrio, sorry, is a costume designer and stylist for Paramount's Younger, Netflix's Friends from College, and NBC's The Village. Confession, I'm addicted to Younger. Uh, my niece made me watch it so I could learn how to communicate with her when it first came on the air. She said, if you want to learn how to talk to me, watch Younger. Um, she was nominated for and won this year's Metropolitan Fashion Award for her designs on Younger. In film, she has designed for The Intern, starring Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. She was the assistant costume designer on films including The Dictator, Sex and the City 2, I was in Sex and the City 1, and Confessions of a Shopaholic. She's worked closely with my good pal and legendary designer costume stylist Patricia Fields. Jacqueline's TV credits as costume designer include Fashion Victim, The Jim Gaffigan Show, Dangerous Liaisons, and The Big C. She was co-costume designer on Saturday Night Live and assistant costume designer on another very fun show, Ugly Betty. In addition to film and television costume design, she's a personal celebrity stylist. I don't know how she has time to do all of this, but her clients include Hilary Duff, Cameron Diaz, Sarah Jessica Parker, Idina Menzel, Laura Linney, and Vanessa Williams. She received her bachelor's degree here at FIT and began her career as a personal shopper at Barney's, where she worked with the celebrities, costume designers, and stylists, and then clearly became one. Next, we have Marcy Rogers, an award-winning and award-nominated costume designer who created the very real 70s wardrobe for Spike Lee's highly acclaimed film Black Klansman, which won the Grand Prix Award at the 2018 Cannes Film Festival. She is known for her ability to bring stories from script to screen through impeccable detail and authenticity. Marcy designed season one of Spike Lee's modern reboot of She's Gotta Have It, which premiered on Netflix. And she was nominated for Best Television Contemporary TV Film Series by the Costume Designers Guild. She's currently working on the show's second season, has recently collaborated with directors including Liz Garbus on her upcoming thriller film, Lost Girls, and Steven Soderbergh for his Netflix drama, High Flying Bird. She received a BBA in marketing at Howard University, went on to receive a corporate MBA from Florida International University, a certificate in fashion design and marketing from Central St. Martin's in London, before graduating with an MFA in custom design from the University of Maryland. That's a lot of degrees. And last but not least, Donna Zakowska. Did I say that right? W is like a V. Zakowska. Okay. Donna. Donna studied painting and dance at Columbia University and the Ecole des Beaux Arts in Paris and is also a graduate of the Yale School of Drama. She's an Emmy Award winner who has designed for film, theater, circus, opera, music, and puppet theater, including nine seasons for the Big Apple Circus and a concert tour for Mick Jagger. Now that's got to be fun. <laughs> Donna began her film work with Woody Allen, John Torturo, and David Sally. She was honored in 2009 by the New York Women in Film and Television. Her work on HBO's uh, John Adams won her both a Costume Designer Guild and Emmy Award in 2009. 
Donna's theater work has included projects with Eve Ensler, William H. Macy, and Julie Taymor, to name a few. She's currently designer of costumes for the very popular, award-winning TV series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which I'm also addicted to, set in New York City in 1958, and she received a 2018 Emmy nomination. And I think that's it for the introductions. So let's have a round of applause for these four spectacular women. So before we start asking them questions, I have a question for the audience. How many of you are students? Oh, come on, hands go up from here, the higher up. And how many of you are jewelry designers? Great. And how many of you have like jewelry, have shops or are in media? Okay, so it's a good cross section. Okay, and how many of you all really love jewelry? All right, there you go. You're in the right place at the right time. Okay, panelists, ladies, can you each tell us, and we'll go across the room here briefly, how you began in this business, and was there something that inspired you to do this work? Like, just a brief description of the career path. Don? Um, okay, yes, this is working. Um, well, I, uh, you know, really began in this business uh, in theater and always had a very strong theatrical sense and, um, you know, loved the idea of costuming and the power of the costume. Uh, and so I pretty much, um, you know, started as a painter, as a dancer, and I found that working in theater combined those two things, movement uh, and color. And so that's really where I began. Began from the fine arts, then uh, ended up going to Columbia and then um, to the Yale School of Drama, and uh, where I pretty much sealed my fate in terms of being a costume designer. And from that point on, uh, you know, began designing for circus and film and theater. But you say it sealed your fate. In what yeah, way? Well, it seemed like something there was no turning back at that point. Uh, well, I think it felt at that moment that all the elements I had been working with, uh, you know, all the sort of tactile elements, all of the conceptual elements, I love research. I love uh, periods and finding out about different things. Somehow it seemed to work in that medium for me. I really felt like, okay, this is it. I feel like I can pursue all of these things that I really love. And uh, so, uh, you know, that was, I pretty much made a decision at that moment uh, that I was going to work in costume design. And then you became an apprentice or an intern or a, uh, Well, we were talking happened. about this earlier. You know, I, I assisted on... Um, I began assisting on Woody Allen movies uh, and uh, worked actually very closely with Woody Allen when I was working on those films and really learned about film and in terms of what I do, not theater, um, a little bit more film, really learned about the camera and sort of the technical medium and how in a way you capture an image and what an image is. And then you begin to understand sort of the power of the image, the power of uh, the character and you become a storyteller. And I think that's what grew as I began to do more and more the understanding that, um, you know, to what I'm doing at this moment, that I am a storyteller and that every piece of clothing, uh, every piece of jewelry, and uh, certainly the period I'm working on now is we have masses of jewelry, indescribable amount of jewelry that we work with because it's so classic, you know, that in, in the 50s that women really wore jewelry. Uh, I really began to understand sort of the gravitas of the choices and the impact that all of these choices have in terms of how people see reality and, um, you know, whether it's you want to... Um, in a way entertain them or whether you want to uh, teach them something about the world as it is or was, uh, everything becomes sort of important. Every detail becomes important. And I am by nature a sort of detail person. So uh, I began to sort of love uh, how that grew in a way, that, that my love of the details uh, in, in my work and in what I was doing. Great. Marcy? Well, as you heard, I have um, several degrees. So my background <laughs> actually was, or is in um, business. But um, 
early 2011, I um, actually prayed to God um, to send me a mentor. And at that time, he sent me Reggie Ray, who was a Broadway costume designer. He designed Holly, if you can hear me. Sorry. And um, so when I, when I came across Reggie Ray, um, he immediately took me under his wing, but he did not teach me costume design. He taught me how to survive because I innately had it in my heart that that's what I wanted to do. As Donna said, I made it my fate. Um, I think I put it out in the universe and then it happened. And that's when I went to study abroad at Central St. Martin's. So I was there in London by myself, um, just pretty much trying to find my path. And while I was there, I read The Alchemist. You, you what? I read The Alchemist, the book. And um, when I came back to America, I knew that my life had forever changed. Fast forward, I started to assist Reggie Ray um, on his Broadway show, and I visited University of Maryland. Because again, I didn't have a theater background. Like, I'm, I come from business. And I met my mentor, Helen Huang, who's the director of the costume design program at University of Maryland. And um, she asked me, why did I want to do it? And I said, because it's in my heart. And so um, I would say maybe two weeks later, I sent her a thank you card, a written thank you card, and that's very important to me. And um, she emailed me back and said, I have an assistantship available. And uh, me coming from education, I was like, wow, you know, it's an internship. I was ready to intern. I mean, I had a full career. I was an assistant director of admissions at Howard's Law School, Howard University. So she called me in and, and I'm really excited. I'm, I'm from Chicago and I tell my parents, I said, I have an assistantship and they're like, okay. So I, she calls me and she says, um, I have an open space in the graduate program at University of Maryland. I want you to start January 1st. So you had a real job and you left that to go back to Well, I had actually assistant. gotten laid off. So at this point, oh. I'm like really going with the flow. Um, and so I started school at University of Maryland and Still assisting Reggie Ray, um, unbeknownst to me, I would say a year after I started school, he passed. So I pretty much, at that time, I was designing theater professionally while in grad school and trying to be a young adult. And um, <clears throat> as, as I'm going through this process, I'm learning how to be a costume designer because again, I did not know what it meant. So my last class um, at University of Maryland, I took a class, it was dramaturgy. And for me, that was what sealed the deal for me to become, I think, and Donna has mentioned this, um, understanding the character and why the character wears what they wear, what they, you know, what certain garments um, solidify them. And um, after that, I interned with, as I said backstage, Ann Roth. <clears throat> I flew to Atlanta with no money in my pocket to assist Ruth Carter. Um, she was doing two shows at the time. Fast forward, and this all happened within like a year. And then I would say maybe... How many years ago was that? Three. Um, I would say three months after that, I'm assisting Paul Taswell. So like, and I'm just really hungry. I just want to learn more and be around who are now my peers, honestly. And then that's when I meet Mr. Lee and then he extended the offer for me to uh, design She's Gotta Have It season one, which was something completely new for me because again, I came from theater. So I just dove right in and ran with it. Just jump in the pool and start swimming. Well, you kind of have to with Spike. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and you're still working with Spike now? Yes. Fantastic. Um, I was a little bit different. I didn't know I wanted to be a costume designer. I came here to FIT and I thought to design you have to know how to sketch. I didn't know how to sketch. What were you studying at FIT? Um, fashion business and merchandising, which I kind of just selected because I knew I was creative. I knew I love fashion more than anything my entire life since I was a little kid. And I just had designs in my head sort of, but I just thought you had to sketch. And I didn't know how to. So I went the business route and I was doing my internship my senior year. And I remember it was either W 
Value Magazine or Barney's. And so I chose Barney. I went on both interviews, but I really liked my boss at Barney's. So I chose Barney's and I was an intern there um, in their studio services office, which we're all very familiar with studio services here. And I, um, it was, opened up my eyes to like a whole different world with. Does the audience know what studio services department is? Why don't you explain It's that? basically a service that all of the um, like boutiques and department stores in New York and Los Angeles uh, let costume designers and stylists come in and pull clothing from the store. Um, basically take everything out on memo for celebrities, everything from editorial shoots to personal shopping clients to film, television, theater even, and um, they allow you to use their service where you can sort of pull um, like at mass amounts almost, do your fittings, return what doesn't work, purchase what works, that sort of thing. So it's a service that's offered to all of us. So I had done an internship there and um, basically my first day I was thrown into, um, Lorenz Scott came in. So and, the late uh, Lorenz Scott, unfortunately. Yeah. And she was by herself, and I remember it was like 5.30 in the afternoon, and sh she was going to Mariah Carey's house with <laughs> like 27 garment bags of clothes. And Laura Mannix, who we all know, said, why don't you go and help her? And I said, of course I will. And that was kind of my crash course with Loren that day, night that led into night um, of a very long fitting. And it was crazy, but I loved it. So I kind of knew I wanted to do fashion. I didn't know if it was celebrity styling or what it was. So I had worked, gotten a job at Barney's. They hired me and became a personal shopper there. And I was there for about eight years before um, Patricia Field was one of my clients. And I was doing a lot of outside fashion styling and was going to leave Barney's. And she said, why don't you come and do um, Sex and the City with me, the first movie? And I said, I don't know anything about production. I don't know how to do any. And she's like, I'll teach you. And she basically did. So she gave me um, gave me a shot and gave me a chance. And I was her assistant on the first movie. We were part of the design team. And I learned so much from her and continued to be her assistant for a few years up until Ugly Betty. And then started costume designing on my own for um, the past like eight years. And then when Younger came along, she actually brought it to me and said, I don't really want to design anymore, but Darren Starr has this show and will you design it? So that's how I got on board with that. And she was a consultant on the show. So that was kind of my way into costume design. And I think the biggest thing for me is coming from fashion and then having to learn about creating characters and it's not just what looks pretty is a whole other thing. It has to tell the story. Not exactly. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Catherine? Um, like Donna, I started uh, in uh, fine arts. I um, specialized in uh, photography and um, I would use a lot of uh, vintage clothes in the photo photography I did and create kind of um, theatrical environments. Um, and um, somehow um, I wound up in New Haven and got to know the drama school and applied there and was lucky enough to get in. And um, I learned so much in the drama school. And the reason why I was attracted to costume design was that it integrated all the things that were so um, interesting to me, combining sociology, psychology, art history, history, literature, and um, the collaboration of creating a fantasy um, with um, your fellow actors, with the director, with the writer creating another world and um, I think for all of us um, the thing that's so exciting is when you see head to toe and you see an actor um, come alive as a character that's written on the page. It's a thrilling experience and when you feel that the actor and the director 
um, kind of responds in a positive fa fashion to what you've pulled together, whether it be shopped or built or what, whatever the method is to get to that place. When it's successful, there's nothing more f thrilling than to be, to have achieved that. And then for all the participants together to um, tell a story and to, you know, hopefully either entertain the public or educate the public or um, a combination of the two is um, it always makes what we do so worthwhile. Well, what was your first break when you left Yale? You, know, you got um, into the, when I left you, Yale into the business. Oh, I, I was I was quite lucky when I left Yale. There was um, a project up at the American Repertory Theater at Harvard, and um, there was a director that um, got um, had a diva fit with the theater, and he just took off with his whole team and said he wasn't coming back. So they had to put a team together really quickly. So um, Andre Serban, who's a great director, was directing. And because I had just gotten out of school, everyone that had a career was busy and booked, and they needed to find somebody within five days. So uh, my teachers recommended me, and it was a great project. It was Brex, the good person of Sichuan. And because of that project, um, a lot of people saw that, and um, my career kind of took off after that. So in many cases, I mean, across the board, timing and luck and all of those things play a big part in in your careers, no matter how much you, you study and plan and strategize. Timing is one of those elements that things happen. I mean, you obviously need the talent and the work after the opportunity presents itself. Um, did any of you ever want to have your own brand or label when you started doing this work? Mm, no. Nope. Definitely not me. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. Um, but it, I guess going back to my business, my business brain, I, I did and I, I started one, but I fell short of it for some reason. Um, and with season one, a lot of the actors and actresses would come to me and say, you should start a brand for each character because each character is particular. Like Mars Blackman, as we know, was played by Spike Lee, but now it's played by Anthony Ramos. So he has, you know, like I, I, I put on Instagram today, I was thinking like, I rebirthed Mars with the help of Spike, of course, but, um, or even Nola Darling, like the 2018 version of Nola Darling is very specific. And so, you know, they would joke and say, Marcy, you need your own fashion, you need your own line. And like you said, I don't know, I don't have time for it. Like if I'm gonna invest into that, then I wanna give it my all. Like I give costume design my all or find a, you know, an assistant that's willing to take my, my ideas and run with it and capital because that's important. I'm just gonna say it's an ongoing thought. <laughs> it's an ongoing thought, okay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> See, it's, it's, it's sneaking out. They all eventually want to do their own thing and have their own, th uh, it's, it's inevitable. Um, so, I mean, a question that's kind of about this is, do you love fashion more or the performing arts? Hmm. I really love the two, and I think um, I think they're symbiotic. Um, I really um, love looking at uh, couture shows, and you know, not just the ones that have recently happened. Even to go back, I mean, think the heyday was the maybe from 2002 to 2011. I mean, there's a you mean before they were all doing hoodies for couture? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there's I, I, I and I think even for us as costume designers. When you look at the wonderful show Donna did, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, I mean, there's that is so connected to fashion. Um, but of course, she has to interpret it. How would each person kind of choose the fashion of the time? But I think it's so much a part of 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 the two. Uh, even if it's the 18th century, there's still fashion plates from the 18th century. 
it's how you interpret it if you do a costume design. It's not everyone um, um, gets uh, maybe a costume that's of that particular year, or maybe it's a little bit older, maybe they style it a little differently, maybe it's too young for them, maybe it's too old for them. Those are the all the things that makes it more human, but it's so much a part of, I think, personally, um, the excitement of um, creating um, costume design is always to reference back to fashion. I think also, I don't think it's such a clear distinction. We are all performers. The minute you step out on the street, the minute you put the clothing you have, you are performing. You, you're, you know, whatever. It's all a theater piece. So I think it's, it's really not as clear, you know, like what is fashion, what is performance. I think we have those names, but I think we're all in a way participating in a large sort of performance piece through our own personal fashion. And uh, so I feel it's not like as clear cut as that in a way. I couldn't agree with you more about that. On my entire career, you tell people you're in fashion, they say to you, oh, I know nothing about fashion. And I say, yes, you do. You're dressed. You know, you put clothing on this morning. And they go, yeah, but I don't. I said, but you made a decision. There's something about what you selected today that you put on that you either wanted to not be noticed, you wanted somebody to notice you, you wanted to feel good, you wanted to feel sexy, you wanted to feel a different way without even realizing it, you're all, everybody's in the fashion business every day. It's the one thing everybody does um, except for a crazy guy on the news last night who was running around neighborhoods naked. Everybody wears clothes. So, I mean, that's it. But since, Catherine, since you brought up Mrs. Maisel, let's, can we talk about that show? Because that is a very strong fashion show. I mean, the clothing, the color, and the accessories. And we're here to talk about the jewelry as, as well. And it does get a little bit short shrift when we're talking all about costume, costume, but the jewelry is such an important part of that. You know, what? How do you research that period? What do you? How do you find what people were wearing? Who lived on the Upper East Side and West Side in the 50s, or you know, the way they lived and and um, dressed in their that cultural moment. Um, well, I think a lot of it is you, know, you work with photographs, you work with fashion magazines internationally, you know, what was going on in America, what was going on in Europe. Um, I, a lot of it is your instinct. I uh, grew up, actually, my mother loved jewelry. I grew up with massive amounts of jewelry. In fact, in Mrs. Maisel, a lot of the jewelry I'm even using comes from the collection that uh, you know my mother had. So I've always been a little bit sensitive to that. Did I mean, you use your mother's jewelry or you copied it and made no, it? No, used it. No. <laughs> Using it all the time. Either, you know. But I think, you know, it really is a question of, you know, dealing with the period, you know, going through the research, and then there's step two is your own personal inspiration. And I think, uh, I know Kathy was saying she came from a fine arts background, I came from a fine arts background, um, you know, in painting uh, at the Beaux-Arts. And I think, you know, you, you set the, the basic structure, where you're going to go, and then you leap. And that leap is what makes your statement personal. It, it's what makes um, your work what it is. So I think it is always grounded in the research, always grounded in absorbing everything you can find out about the period and then following your own artistic instinct in, in the interpretation. So do you, um, do you do the research and then do you draw up all the kinds of looks for a season in advance? How, do you, how does well, it work? We, you... I wouldn't say that, uh, I mean, I love drawing, but we never have the time really to do that very much. But what we do do is like very extensive research boards for each look. And uh, actually my assistant who's here tonight, Marina, I will tell you, we spent like hours, you know, trying to find the right piece of fabric. What is the pink? Oh, we want it to be pink, but what pink do we want it to be? So I think we sort of build these levels of research uh, that feed into the next, you know, sort of episode in the next season. But you're always in the situation of trying to figure out what is, what can you do that is a little bit more exciting or a little bit more special. You know, there's no such thing as just coasting it. I think it's really a, a constant challenge to figure out how to design something like Mrs. Maisel, especially since from the beginning we really went out on the limb in terms of like, you know, working with the color and having a sort of um, 
you know, couture sense to a degree to what we were doing. Once we started that journey, it was like there was, you know, again, we couldn't turn back. We, and it, it becomes a very, you know, intense process trying to produce those items for the series. So from all those boards, somebody designs every specific look, and then is it made in shops in New York? Uh, well, what we do is pull the research together. Sometimes it isn't one element, it's a few elements that create the costume, and then we build it in New York, basically. I mean, most of our principal clothing is built. You could never build all of the extras because we have, you know, close to, like I think last season, 4,000 people that we had to costume in addition to the principals. But the principals are pretty much come from, you know, uh, deciding each individual item, and then there are various shops in New York that we go to, and uh, we have our own shop, but we build it in various shops in New York. And in addition to your mother's jewelry, is there some, is there some piece of jewelry that stands out to you for a, a show or a season that that really speaks to who that person and character is? Um, well, I think in season two, which will be coming, uh, one of our characters, the mother, uh, sort of becomes a, a bohemian, Parisian bohemian. And so I found a lot of, and in a way, of course, this would be something I would love personally, I found a lot of very interesting sort of crazy pieces that were, you know, that are much more sculptural, much more reflect um, sort of a graphic sort of sense. Because I'm by nature a minimalist when it actually comes to jewelry. But uh, I think in season two you will see like a lot of very, very interesting pieces. Uh, and that really helped, that jewelry helped me to push that character forward actually. When does season two start? Uh, December 5th. Oh, soon. Yeah. Coming up soon. Yeah. Have you all, you've all watched the show? Yes? It's fantastic. Speaking of specific pieces of jewelry that resonate on a show, I'm sorry, but we have to go to Younger. I mean, is the Diana, is that her name on the Yeah, show? Diana. Diana. Trout. I mean, it's a hoot every week just to see what she's wearing and her necklaces. How did that come about in the development? Which every one of us would respect is so collaborative and the second she gets into that costume and the second we found her, that was it for her. The second head to toe she was in that costume, she became Diana Trout. So it kind of started, I was doing tears of Linda Fargo. That was actually, <laughs> um, you know, a little bit, she was start, started, everything was always over the top. It was always going to be hyper reality. Everything was exaggerated, especially with her and her world. And it was almost like she was still kind of, you know, to separate the, the millennials in the office and her, we wanted to have this big, you know, to dif really differentiate the two of them. It was almost going to have that sort of 80s, power dressing thing with her, but she's in contemporary clothes. You know, she's still buying her clothes at Bergdorf's and Barney's or wherever, And but it, the silhouettes, the shoulder pads, the sort of armor that she puts on. Um, so we started with that, with the, the, the Linda Fargo inspiration. And then the accessories just got a little crazier and crazier and um, then I tried to actually bring it back a little bit uh, in season two when she was like these earrings are small or this is not big enough I'm like okay you're odd. this is insane like you weigh this is an extra 20 pounds around your neck <laughs> so I kind of had to like bring her down a little bit but um, it's fun it's a really fun ride with her and finding all these pieces and I'm always looking for interesting jewelry Jewelry and well, how, do, how do you find all that jewelry? Is it local artists and designers and craftspeople? Do they come to you or send you things and say, "Use my necklace"? Some Here's do. My earrings? Yeah, some do. But I like to scout a lot. I mean, I'm um, a lot of it's vintage. A lot of it uh, I find everywhere from I mean showrooms to the yeah, local New York designers. There are people that reach out to me from other areas. I mean, people in the Midwest are like sending me Facebook messages about using their jewelry and. 
I welcome everything, so. <laughs> I love it all, and I'm always looking for jewelry. Every week I'm on the wardrobe truck, I don't have enough jewelry for this show. That's crazy. <laughs> but do you des ever design anything original for it, or it's really yeah. found things? Um, well, like for instance, the big red flower, I don't know if you remember that, when she was in a red Lan Van Huge, gown. Yes. We de I designed that, and we had, we, we couldn't figure out what, and that was really part of the story, because she was breaking up with her boyfriend, and it was sort of this stripped down feeling that we've never seen of her character before and we wanted her to put something when she walked out after she broke up with them she looks in the mirror and she takes this huge red silk chiffon choker out and she puts it back on and it was kind of like oh here I, I'm back powering moment yeah was, yeah so there have been pieces that I have made for her as well. And the clothing on that show, though, is ready to wear that exists. It is ready to wear, yeah. So you're like sending somebody to Barney's to get clothes and stuff like you used to do. Yeah. I do a lot of the shopping myself, though, too, because I love to do that. <laughs> I get a little... Uh... It's a good career. You get paid to shop and buy <laughs> lots of great clothes and dress people in it. Yeah, it's fun. And, and even the interaction with the other characters, every one of them on that show has such a distinct kind of personality. Yeah. And especially Sutton Foster being the 41 trying to play a 26-year-old. I mean, how did, how did, what kind of She's clothing and accessories do you use to... That really, like, that whole story has really evolved over time. Um, in the pilot, it was almost... You know, it was almost like she didn't know what she was doing. She was layering and accessorizing and putting things together that she thought was on trend or what her thoughts of what a millennial would wear. And it kind of then has evolved with her and her storyline through the show, which has actually been really great because I've been kind of able to strip her down and gotten to who she really is. Her millennial daughter doesn't dress like that. No. So it was sort of meant to be this she was just kind of confused, you know? And and every character is, they they all have their own sensibility. I mean, you know, now I go into a store and I'm, even now I'm not even on that show, I'm on another show, and I'm like, oh, that's good for Hillary. Oh, that's good for Liza. That's good. I mean, immediately, I see their clothes. I see, see them. See things that speak to you for each other. Yeah, part. they all speak to me, pieces, and wherever I am. Doesn't matter what country I'm in. <laughs> And what happens to all that clothing? Does do, do they ever get to go home with any of it? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Some of them bring them back and are good. But we keep most of them throughout the season because we're going to be starting season six. So we do have, have the majority of them still. And in Black Klansman jewelry, there's a couple of iconic pieces that um, speak to those characters. Do you want to talk about those, um, Marcy? Sorry, I apologize. Um, so for John David Washington, um, I've gotten a lot of questions about his jewelry and um, as I said earlier, when I spoke with Ron, the real Ron Starworth, I asked him what could I do to make this character real? And so he said um, when he would go undercover, he would put on jewelry that would make him look cool. And um, at the time, I got so excited because he taught me about, we're all adults here, the Coke spoon, which is a pendant that pimps used to wear in the 70s. And so, I was like, the Coke spoon, and he says, ask your father. So I <laughs> called my dad and I said, um, I just learned about the Coke spoon. And he's like, <laughs> First of all, why you learn about that? But that was an integral piece of jewelry that Mr. Starworth wore. Fast forward, I custom made that for John David Washington. And I remember sending it to set, and Spike said, no. And I don't know why. Um, I think he just wanted to play it down a bit. So what I started to do was I would go into Michael's myself and choose pendants that I felt reflected the character as well as my color palette. Um, and there's also a necklace that Mr. Lee gifted to Patrice via Ron Starworth, which is the Afro. It's an Afro pick, but it's a pendant. Um, and I remember coming to set that day and Spike said, I want you to give this to Laura Herrera, um, who plays Patrice. And that was pretty much it. I mean, I didn't question 
his thought process behind it because he obviously is the director and intuitively I think he knows what he wants and what will eventually become iconic and it has. So that was pretty much it. Um, but I will say when John David Washington, when he would get into character, he would put on his jewelry and he would put on his coat and immediately he transported back into the 70s and I think a lot of it had to do with his jewelry. Mm -hmm. And shoes. I actually custom made shoes for him as well. Interesting. And Catherine, let's talk about war paint, which is a story of two extraordinary, legendary women in the cosmetic industry. Tell yes. us about it was them. about uh, Helena Rubinstein and um, Elizabeth Arden and their rivalry, and it took us from 1935 into 1963. And uh, the great thing about the project, um, besides the wonderful actresses playing the roles, Patti Lapone and Christine Ebersole, was um, the fact that Helena Rubinstein had an amazing jewelry collection. So it was an opportunity um, to recreate um, all the iconic pieces that she had. And there's a wonderful uh, jewelry maker here in town, um, Larry Verber, who I work with quite a bit, who did such an amazing job. We um, look at the research and he just, and we looked at photographs of what she would wear. There were some scenes in the, in the musical where we didn't have um, research that would be a dead on reference to the moment. So we had to kind of extrapolate what would she have worn given what we know about her. And uh, so it was wonderful to think as Helena and what would she have worn in this situation. And the wonderful thing about her was always more is more. Like when you really looked at the pictures, there must have been about five necklaces on at once and a million brooches and the biggest earrings she could find. I mean, she was so great at kind of laying it all on and having it look wonderful. And to uh, counteract that, Elizabeth Arden was so um, discreet. It was always pearls and very tasteful, um, exquisite, high-end jewelry. When Helena Rubinstein, a lot of it was paste mixed in with great jewelry altogether, you know, to a wonderful effect. And um, the thing is, too, when you're doing jewelry for musicals um, or, in, or a stage play, um, because, you know, it's time sensitive and people have to take things on and off so quickly, um, everything has to be rigged. So even though the jewelry, you know, has the appearance of being authentic, it's all magnetized in the back and all the clasps have to be covered in net or, and the prongs in the jewelry have to be touched with glue so they don't kind of snag on other costumes. Um, so there's a lot of things like behind the scenes in, in theater that kind of, that I think, I mean, I don't do um, film or television. I, I think maybe you can use things in a more authentic manner. Um, but but for um, music, you know, for, the, for something like um, war paint. It was um, not only the design of the jewelry, but how it functioned. And there were a lot of quick changes in there? A lot of quick changes uh, because it moved through time and both ladies were in pretty much every scene. Um, they had to have a head-to-toe transformation. And some of those, we only had 30 seconds. You know, they go backstage and you know, it looks like, you know, a complete ensemble, ensemble and there's a big old zipper down the back that just comes off like a sleeping bag, basically. Um, but it's all constructed um, because of the quick change issue. The magic of theater. Yeah. Um, now, Mrs. Rubinstein had extraordinary jewelry and, and gems through the years. There was yeah. a beautiful exhibit at the Jewish Museum yes. several years ago of all her work and yeah. her stuff. And I think she was such an artist herself. Everything about her life was so artistic, her homes, the furniture, everything was so beautiful and I think she collaborated with a lot of artists um, on, on her pieces for jewelry. I mean she participated if she went to a great jeweler I think she got really involved in some of the design. So after that play is over, what happens to all of those th things? Anything? Um, right now it's with the producer. He kept it all. So um, <laughs> um, normally on a play it will go to um, um, or a musical, it'll go to uh, the costume collection or a donation to another theater. Um, 
like Goodspeed or Paper Mill. Okay. Sometimes it's sad when you work so hard on something and costumes become so valuable and then when the process is over, it's basically like it becomes you know, something that is a problem and how do we store it, it becomes a nuisance. Where at one time it was, had so much prestige. It's, it's quite ironic, the journey I, I a had this can take. lucky privilege of when I was on Sunset Boulevard to go backstage with a designer friend of mine and they're great friends with Glenn Close. Oh, wow. And she took us through every basket and everything that she wore. And it was from the original production of that many of the pieces. Yes. I mean, these things weighed a ton and beaded and uh, yes. un unbelievable. You know, when you really see that behind the scenes exactly. theater of all the things there and how that works, it's, it's a, it's yeah. Quite remarkable. And the thing is, for, for theater, they have to be made in a way that's much more durable. Because when you um, can use a vintage garment, it's it's so wonderful because if, I don't know if this is correct, but if you have like a take in, in, in a film, as long as it's on camera and it's done, it's kind of like you've passed the scary moment. But in theater, you can't, uh, something would fall apart if it had to be used over and over again eight times a week and ripped off quickly and it just wouldn't survive. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of the garments, like let's say in Sunset Boulevard, they were probably made much more heavily than it would have been if it was a film. So who is the ultimate decision maker in this process when you collaborate with everybody on these shows and movies? Is it the director? Is yes. it the producer? Yes. He, that's his yes, yes no, yes. I don't like that. Do you, do you have arguments and fight oh, them yeah. and say, no, this is right for the part? Oh, yeah. I do. I yeah, it depends. <laughs> um, something on like a film, it's always the director. Um, when I did the intern, Nancy Myers and I were super, super collaborative about things, and luckily we were on the same page a lot of the time, which would made it really nice. But I've had the times where you're not on the same page, and it's either you fight the good fight or you get exhausted by it. But usually if it's your design and your vision, you really fight for it. And does the performer or the actress or the main character do, do they have any say in it that really matters or overrules any anybody? It depends on, on who it is, but they do. They definitely have a say as well. Because you also don't want an actor to be in something that... Grumpy. Yeah, I mean, they don't want to be in something that's going to... They're going to be thinking about, they don't feel comfortable, and it's going to... You don't want them to their performance to be disrupted because of the costume. I mean, you know, ultimately it's a collaboration. And when all the pieces are in place, the director, the actress, you, you're all happy. And I think the best costumes are a product of collaboration rather than uh, something that just comes out of your head. I think it really has, it's, it's a sort of energy that moves together to that final result. Sounds good. Is there anything you all have on your next project that you want to talk about or mention that's coming up that we may not have known in the bios? Um, I'm doing an exciting project that involves jewelry. I'm doing a musical of Moulin Rouge based on the film. And we had a tryout in Boston uh, last summer. Just move it closer, I think, to you. It's on. Oh, there it is. And um, again, it was a lot of jewelry that had come on and off quite quickly, but there's um, a lot of jewelry in that show, and it was really fun to create. So this is going to be a Broadway Yes, it's a Broadway musical. Mm -hmm. It's going to open in July. And um, it's, it's really uh, a lot of fun. Um, the music has been, it's a combination of music that was in the film, but it's been updated. So is, is Baz Luhrmann involved in the Broadway production? He's sort of like the godfather. Um, that's how he likes to call himself. Like, But um, Alex Timbers is the director. Um, and isn't his wife a costume designer too? Yes. Yeah, yeah she did, um, she's a production designer and a costume designer, and she's quite brilliant. So um, it was a little bit intimidating. Uh, last year was a little scary because um, I was working on Moulin Rouge and My Fair Lady, and they both um, have very iconic um, designers behind the films. And um, 
So uh, it was interesting, both very different, but it was quite interesting to um, um, to have those um, uh, uh, to uh, live up to expectations given uh, people's sentiments about those films. My Fair Lady jewelry is extremely important. Is yes. I think that's one of the images we all have of Audrey Hepburn and My Fair Lady right. with that necklace at the yeah. end coming out. Yeah. That was a statement yes. piece where the jewelry just spoke volumes. Yeah, we uh, recreated a piece of jewelry like that. Again, Larry Verber um, made it for us. And um, uh, when we first had it on, the first actress that played the role, Lauren Ambrose, um, when she uh, sang, because of the magnets, it would pop off, you know, <laughs> because, um, you know, she used her neck muscles so much. So we had to come up with another way to get the jewelry off quickly because there's a scene where she's saying, take this jewelry back, I don't want it. I'm paraphrasing. That's the line is much more eloquent than that, but that's basically what she's saying. And um, so we had to come up with another technique to get that jewelry off quickly. Um, another thing that was interesting. So you have to be engineers as well as designers. Yes, exactly. Laura Benanti took over the role a couple of weeks ago, and she has very different coloring. And I don't know if all of you have come up against that, but sometimes you can have. Um, certain research and a set of jewelry will look great on one person and then if somebody else is taking over a role or there's, you know, um, you have to kind of rethink your color palette to, to make it um, flattering um, for, for somebody's, um, you know, the, the, the things that make them who they are. It's Lauren Benanti, the one who plays Melania Trump yes. on Late Night on yeah, Stephen Colbert. Yeah, she's great. She's so funny. She's funny. Yeah. Oh, she was. Isn't she great? Yeah, she's so much fun. Yeah. What's next? Um, I'm currently sneak? doing a NBC show called The Village. Um, it's an ensemble, very heartwarming, character-driven show um, that will be premiering, I believe, in February, and then go back overlap with younger the village being Greenwich Village or the village, village being somewhere? a um, Brooklyn apartment building called the village where all these different people's lives sort of interact and their stories and how they all sort of intersect From what period modern contemporary yeah. oh. mm -hmm. so cool new cool Brooklyn yeah, new cool Brooklyn, but with some old souls, some real old original Brooklynites as well. It's uh, Dominic Sheanese, who used to play Uncle Junior on The Sopranos. He's so great. So he's... Fantastic. Yeah. I'm an original Brooklynite. And what's next for you? I'm actually designing um, Lost Girls, which is directed by Liz Garbos. She was the director for What's Happening Miss Simone um, on Netflix. It's a biopic about a mother who is bringing her daughter to justice. I want to say uh, maybe 10 years ago, there were it was the Craigslist murders in Gilgo Beach, uh, Suffolk County. And so the story is sadly about her trying to um, bring her daughter home, um, but they find her daughter uh, her daughter is the tenth of the last to be found of the ten victims that were the bodies, the bones were found. Um, so that's what I'm doing. A thriller. A Something thriller. different. And, um, um, and I'm just beginning season three of Mrs. Maisel uh, relatively soon, beginning of the year. Well, that's going to keep going for a long time, we, we hope. Okay. Um, Last question for you all, and then I think there's some audience questions we're going to go to. Um, what is the best piece of advice someone gave you, or wish they had, you wish they had given you, or what is the best advice you would give somebody? Let's start with you on this side, Tom. I guess the, you know the the main advice is you have to absolutely sort of love it. You have to be committed to it. Um, you know, it's a little bit like um, it, it does sort of engulf your whole life. So I think if you really don't feel the passion for it, then I think it's something you just shouldn't even contemplate doing. But uh, if you do, I think that's what will really impact your work. I think it is your passion for the work that really becomes um, the important thing in terms of what people experience when they see your work. Okay. 
I have a few things that I learned early on from Reggie Ray. He told me first, don't take it personal. Don't take it personally. That's great. And I was very sensitive when I came into this business um, because I was with him 24 hours a day and he was moody. So he would always tell me, don't take it personal. And two, I would say never stop learning. Um, I think for me, I'm, I'm curious by nature. My friends make fun of me because I'm always watching the news. But as I've coined myself to be like a visual historian, I have to keep learning so that I can keep telling stories and that I can keep collaborating with directors. And when I bring that specific research to the director, they get excited about the story that they're telling because they've done the research, you know, and I'm, I'm informing everybody. Um, and don't be afraid to collaborate. I think Donna has mentioned that. That's very important on any project that you have. I mean, that's just in life. Just understand what it means to collaborate. And once you understand it, I think you, you pretty much have the foundation. I think for the students, it's just working with a lot of, I have an interns or young students that come to me and I just feel like I really, really notice, believe me, everyone notices when you're working hard. It is something that for some reason has been harder to find lately, but when I notice someone, you may not think I'm noticing, but any little detail, anything that you just do that sort of any extra, it goes so, it goes so noticed, and I just feel like that was always why I felt like I got my start. I worked really hard as an intern, and it really paid off. So I think, just remember, we're all watching. <laughs> That's true. Um, I would agree that um, you just really have to have a passion for what it is you want to do so you don't resent the long hours and sometimes the compromises you need to make. You have to love it enough to say, no, this is what I want to do and I know there's some choices I need to make in my life in order to make this happen and I feel good about that. Um, I also feel um, it is great to, um, you know, as Marcy said, the collaboration is so important to love to, to be with other experts in their field and enjoy, enjoy that process. Um, and to always believe in yourself and even if you feel, um, and to have your own voice um, because that's what's going to make you stand um, in front of the pack if you have your own kind of um, story to tell in your own unique way. Always stick with that and um, know that, you know, if, if you really feel passionate about it, you will be heard. I also just want to add one thing. I feel like as a woman and all of us up here, we work really long and we work really hard hours in production and you can have it all. I have kids, I have a husband, I have a life, and I have a great career. So I think that's just really important to say to the women out there. Well, you are very organized.